Good evening. That I feel like I should say Shabbat Shalom or something, but that's not the time. I'll say, but I will say Chodesh Tov. That uh, it's the start of the new Jewish month, so I'll say Chodesh Tov. Yeah. It's, okay. I'm getting lots of signals from different people. So w welcome, I'm Rabbi Greg Harris, uh, and on be behalf of the congregation, and also Rabbi Werbin is here as well, uh, over in the back, I want to welcome you to Bethel, that very excited for tonight's presentation, that, um, um, that Ken Levine in just a moment will give a, a, fuller, uh, a fuller introduction, um, but this is, fits within our focus throughout the year on different aspects and different parts of Israel. We've been very excited for engaging in the conversation that uh, earlier in the year, Ambassador Mark G uh, Ginsburg was here, David Siegel was here as our scholar in residence, our Shaliach Itzik Sayag, where is Itzik? Oh, he just stepped out for a second. Oh, there he is. Right, Itzik has been here now for two years, and we are excited, but so sorry for him to be going back to Tel Aviv, uh, and has added so much energy within the school, within the congregation in so many ways, um, that we've had our monthly Israel media series, our, hum our Hebrew literature group, um, our focus in the classes and the schools, um, that uh, the head of Israel Aid was here not too long ago, and we'll be back again, uh, that Yotam Polizer uh, was here, Israeli dancing, and on and on and on, that uh, we are here because we want to engage in understanding more about Israel, the politics, the culture, the experience, uh, and I hope throughout the year and in years to come that you'll feel that the congregation is a place to both be comfortable and also to be challenged because that's exactly what we need to, to be when we are engaging in the topic of Israel. It is both filled with love, um, and that love translated into reality comes with a lot of complexity, um, and, uh, and this is the perfect place, and tonight is the perfect night to be really jumping in more. So I want to invite up Ken Levine to give Benny more of a, a, a fuller uh, introduction, and, uh, and so glad that you're with us tonight. Uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, my name is Ken Levine. I'm a member of the Am Yisrael Chai Committee here at Bethel. And I have the honor today to, uh, uh, to introduce you to uh, perhaps the most famous and some would say most controversial Israeli historian, Benny Morris. The modern state of Israel is about to celebrate its 70th birthday. And it's wonderful to learn and listen to the man who has written extensively about the war that created Israel. Benny Morris is a professor of history in the Middle East Studies Department at Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Beersheba, Israel. He is currently the Aaron and Cecile Goldman Visiting Professor at Georgetown University. Professor Morris was born on a kibbutz and was brought up in Jerusalem and New York. His father was an Israeli diplomat, historian, and poet. His mother was a journalist. He served in the Israeli infantry from 1967 through 1969. In 1988, his artillery unit was called up was called up for reserve duty in the West Bank. He refused to serve and spent three weeks in jail. He earned a bachelor's degree from Hebrew University and a PhD in modern European history from Cambridge University in England. After earning his PhD, he returned to Jerusalem and worked as a correspondent for the Jerusalem Post for 12 years. While working for the Post, he started reading Israeli government documents which had recently been declassified and started to tell the story of Israel's War of Independence. That is how he became a historian. In 
writing at least 10 books on the Israel-Arab situation, including 1948, A History of the First Arab-Israeli War. That book was the winner of the National Jewish Book Award in 2008. His work has won praise and criticism from both the left and the right. He is part of a, uh, a group called New Historians and has been somewhat controversial for using Israeli government documents to show that Israeli forces did not always do the right thing in the theater of war. He regards himself as a Zionist and said, I embarked upon the research not out of ideological commitment or political interest. I simply wanted to know what happened. His topic tonight is looking anew at the 1948 war. Benny Morris. Thank you, Ken. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to talk about the 48 war. Uh, almost everything which was said about me is true, <laughs> though I'm, I'm no longer on the staff of Ben Gurion University. I'm emeritus. I retired there uh, from there last year. Um, the, the 1948 war was the most important of the Israeli-Arab wars. There have been five, six, it depends how you count them, is, is since, but um, <laughs> that's the war which was most important historically in that it did, it did two things. It planted in the heart of the Middle East, an Arab and Muslim area, a Jewish state, separating, in fact, the Arab and Muslim uh, areas into two parts, cutting them in two, if you like, um, and it also shattered the war, shattered Palestinian Arab society uh, with the most um, <laughs> important expression of that collapse, uh, the, creating the Palestinian refugee problem, which is with us today and is probably the most important, uh, most significant stumbling block or obstacle to peace between Israel and the Palestinians. What to do about the uh, refugees? I'll talk about them in a, in a second. <laughs> So uh, it is the most important of the wars, um, in, historically. Um, the war was, uh, came at the end as the culmination of 70 years of uh, essentially struggle between the native Arab population of the land, Palestine, the land of Israel, uh, and the incoming settling uh, Jewish uh, Zionist immigrants. Um, there were bouts of um, uh, hostilities initiated mostly by the Arabs uh, over those 70 years before 1947. Um, during the l last period, the British ruled from 1917-18 until 1948. <laughs> um, the British tired of ruling over these two warring ethnic groups um, and couldn't find a solution, couldn't impose a solution, and took the problem of Palestine uh, to the United Nations, or in a sense handed it back to the United Nations, they'd received their mandate from the League of Nations, and the successor was the United Nations. They gave the problem back to the UN at the beginning of 47. <laughs> the UN ultimately decided in that famous vote, 29th of November 47, a, on a partition solution to the Palestine problem. Two Jews, would, two states would arrive, a, would um, a, arise in the land of Israel, which would be divided between the two. Uh, the Arabs rejected the partition resolution, uh, the Palestinian Arabs and the Arab states around, and uh, began hostilities against the Jewish community in Palestine, um, which gradually snowballed into a full-scale civil war and was followed by a conventional war. The 48 war was made up of two parts. The first part from November 47 until May 48 was a civil war between the two ethnic or national groups in Palestine, the Jews and the Arabs, uh, who were fighting against each other, while Britain officially, nominally, was the um, sovereign of the land. <laughs> the Jews won that civil war by the middle of no, um, May 1948 and declared statehood on the 14th of May, and on the 15th, the Arab armies 
of the surrounding countries except Lebanon <laughs> invaded the country and most of them attacked the Jewish state. And that began a conventional war between the Arab states who were invading and the Jewish state which had just been proclaimed. And that war lasted until January 1949. So the 48 war divides into those two, two halves. Over the past 30 odd years, I've been looking at the war, various aspects of the war, uh, the refugee problem as it was created and other things. And um, in, 19, in 2008, I published a book called 1948, which was a general history of the war. And essentially, I'm going to give you some, talk about some of the conclusions uh, um, uh, of that research. <laughs> and the first one relates to the nature of the war. What was the 1948 war? What was it about? And the conventional wisdom has it that the war was a territorial political war between two national groups, eventually states, um, over a, a piece of land. Or a, It was unusual, incidentally, as a political territorial war in that it was fought by the two sides, uh, certainly from the Arab side, about the whole of Palestine. Usually wars, national wars between groups or states are fought about borderlands as between France and Germany uh, um, over the 19th, 20th centuries, uh, fighting about Alsace-Lorraine, for example. They don't fight about the whole country. <laughs> this war, if it was a territorial political war, and it was to some extent, uh, it was fought about the whole land, certainly from the Arab side, who wanted all of Palestine and claimed all of Palestine as their own and wanted no Jewish presence, certainly no Jewish state, no Jewish sovereign area in any part of Palestine. Um, but my contention after going over the documentation and thinking about it over the past 20, 30 years <laughs> is that the war was also, um, in terms of its nature, was also a religious war or religious cultural war, uh, certainly as perceived by the Arabs who were fighting it from one of the sides. Um, on the 2nd of December, 1947, that is, three or four days after the partition resolution passed at the United Nations, three or four days after the Arabs began shooting, they began shooting the Palestinian Arabs on the 30th of November, the day after the resolution passed. On the 2nd of December, 47, the ulama of Al-Azhar University in Cairo, Al-Azhar is the oldest university in the Arab world, um, its ulama, its council of theologians or wise men in terms of religion, um, is the most important body in Sunni Islam which interprets God's will or what the Quran means on specific issues, what Islam means in specific issues. And the ulama of Al-Azhar, shared by the Sheikh of Al-Azhar, um, <laughs> proclaimed jihad on the 2nd of December 1947, saying that the, the Muslim world should unite and essentially attack the emergent Jewish state. Those who can should come and fight, those who can't should contribute money, political support. But the Arab world in this, at least the Sunni Arab world, which is the majority in the Arab world, most Arabs are Sunnis, a minority are Shiites, um, a, a, this declared holy war, jihad, against the Jewish state. <laughs> the ulama of Al-Azhar, repeated this call for jihad, this fatwa, which is a religious ruling, um, in April 1948, a few days before the Arab states invaded the country on the 15th of May. In other words, they were telling the armies and the, the, the leaders of the Arab world, you have the imprimatur of religion to go and attack the Jewish state. It's God's command. And strangely enough, the ulama of Al-Azhar repeated the fatwa, the jihadi fatwa, in December 1948, by which time the Arabs had essentially lost the war at the end of 1948, but they repeated it, basically saying, we've lost this round, but you, the Arab leaders, you, the Muslim people, or Muslim Ummah nation, must continue the jihad even after we've lost this first round into a second or third round, etc., etc. That's what this repeating a proclamation of jihad meant. The sense that the Arab world was going to jihad at the end of 1947 
beginning of 1948, was echoed in various places. It wasn't just the religious, the wise religious leaders of uh, Sunni Islam. Um, Matiel Muranam <laughs> was a Lebanese Christian woman who'd married an East a Jerusalemite, a Muslim, uh, I think he was Muslim, um, a, a Muslim um, uh, from, from Jerusalem and moved to Jerusalem and there headed a body which wasn't very important, was called the Arab or the, the Palestinian Arab a Muslim Women's Association, which was associated with the Arab Higher Committee. The Arab Higher Committee was the ruling body of the Palestine Arab National Movement, headed by Haj Amin al Husseini. And it had a small woman's affiliate. And she was the head of this woman's affiliate, this lady, Matiel al Muranam, a Christian from Lebanon. In January 1948, two months into the war, she was um, uh, interviewed, and she said the following in her interview. The UN decision has united all Arabs, as they have never been united before, not even against the Crusaders. A Jewish state has no chance to survive now that the holy war has been declared. All the Jews will eventually be massacred. This is a Christian lady from Lebanon, living in Jerusalem. <laughs> Following the 48th uh, invasion on the 15th of May, that is the, the Arab state's invasion of Palestine and the attack on the Jewish state, the Saudi regime, <laughs> um, Saudi Arabia, yes, uh, organized jihadi festivals, what they called jihadi festivals. And thousands registered there as volunteers for the war in Palestine. Um, uh, one foreign report, one diplomat's report from Riyadh um, uh, said that 200,000 are ready to perform jihad and sacrifice their lives. That's what he heard Saudi officials telling him. Uh, only a few thousand probably ended up in Palestine, maybe even less from Saudi Arabia, but there was a certain amount of jihadi voluntarism from the Muslim world. We know of tens if not hundreds of Bosnian Muslims who came and fought and some of them died in Palestine in the course of 48 um, we know of thousands who came from the Maghreb, from Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. Not all of them reached Palestine. They were stopped. Uh, some of them, many of them, by the British in, in, in Egypt, <laughs> weren't allowed to cross into Palestine. Uh, but, but thousands did volunteer from various parts of the Muslim world. You have to remember, it's not like today's voluntarism, where people get on a plane and fly to Ankara and then uh, cross the border into Syria. Uh, it was very difficult to get to Palestine from Morocco. Um, uh, at the time or from Bosnia. <laughs> but there were thousands who did actually join the fight. Um, one last small item. A, a man called Emil Guri, who was a member of the Arab Higher Committee, that body which in a sense governed or certainly led the Palestine Arab National Movement, in August 48 gave an interview to the day, and he was a Christian, Emil Guri. He gave an interview to the Telegraph in London, the Daily Telegraph, and he said, we must inculcate in the heart of every Arab hatred for the Jews. This is August 48. The Palestinians have lost the war. This is one of the exiled leaders of the Palestinian cause. We must inculcate in the heart of every Arab hate, uh, hatred for the Jews, and we must renew the jihad against Israel. Now, these are impressionistic pieces of evidence, uh, um, eclectic. Um, <laughs> And nobody has yet done a full study, and it's not that easy to do it, of how widespread was the idea of jihad as the propellant of this war making, first by the Palestinians, then by the Arab states. How, how solid was it as the motive to go to war, as distinct, say, from the, the political territorial ambition? And in Islam, it's not that easy to separate politics and religion. Um, usually people thought in, of both things within one framework. But it's clear from the impressions, the, this sort of impressionistic e evidence, that um, there was a religious fervor in the Arab world and among the Palestinians, and this was part of their motivation in going to war. How to weigh the, 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 the quantity, how much was political thinking, how much was religious, can't be done. But, but it was there as a solid, and if you like, I can just give one more observation about the Israeli-Arab conflict in general. <laughs> it's always had a religious element uh, over the past hundred and so years. 
with rising up and down a more religion and less religion in the politics on the Arab side. <laughs> but when looking at the 48 war in general, I think one can say there was more than just the political, territorial, nationalist motivation in terms of its nature. About the war aims of the two sides, and here maybe some of what I'll say will sound to you a bit iconoclastic. Well, on the Jewish side, in the two parts of the war, there was a clear, obvious, and certainly true um, motivation, um, and that was survival. The Jews were defending themselves against an ons onslaught by the Palestinian Arab militias and community, and they were defending themselves, defending the issue of the Jewish community in Palestine, defending the emergent state. And following the 15th May a, a assault on the, a 1948 by the Arab states, again, it was essentially its main motivation of the Jewish community in Palestine was to defend itself, that is, to survive, to weather the storm of invasion, and to a, a maintain and establish their state. And that's certainly the major motivation on the Jewish part and the major, major um, war aim of the Jewish side um, in, in this war. But I, I would say that two additional uh, aims accrued on the Jewish side uh, in the course of the war. One, and I don't think historians, most historians would uh, differ on this, one which came into play in March, April 48, in other words, three, four, five months into the war, and that was to expand the territory of the Jewish state beyond the borders allocated by the United Nations General Assembly in the Partition Resolution. The Partition Resolution gave the Jews something close to 6,000 square miles of the 10,000 plus square miles of which Palestine is constituted, something like 55% of the territory. And the war ended with the Jews holding 8,000 square miles, not what the UN said, 6,000 plus, but something like 8,000 of the 10,000 plus. So expansion happened, and I would say it didn't happen of its own. It was part of the a, a driving force that was intended by the Jewish side, not from the start of the war, because the Jews accepted the UN resolution and the borders earmarked by the United Nations in that resolution, but three or four months into being attacked by the Palestinian Arabs, they decided, well, if they want war, we'll give them war and we'll take more territory. <laughs> it's worth adding to that that Ben-Gurion never wanted and never sought all of t Palestine in the war. In other words, he wanted more than what the UN gave but less than all of Palestine. That's why the war ended with Israel holding only 8,000 and not the full 10,000 square miles of Palestine. In fact, the commander of Southern Front in the IDF, a man called Igal Alon in March 1939, sorry, 49, said, wrote to Ben-Gurion suggesting, let's conquer the West Bank, which had been taken over by the Jordanians in the course of the war. And Ben-Gurion said, no, this is March 1949, when it was possible to do it very easily. Two, three days, and the West Bank would have fallen. <laughs> Israel, by the end of the war, was much, much stronger than all the Arab states, and certainly 100%, you know, 100 times stronger than just Jordan. But it, uh, he refrained from doing that. <laughs> now, when you get to the Arab side, what were the motivations or what were the war aims of the Arab side? First, you have to divide between the Palestinians in their civil war half. And then you have to talk about the Arab states, which didn't have uniform motivations. They weren't all aiming for the same thing from May 1948 onwards. And there's a major problem in general about understanding the Arab side, and that is lack of documentation. We have full, uh, almost full documentation from the Israeli side. There's a lot of Israeli archives. They're very liberal in opening them. <laughs> you have access to them, and you can see almost everything. Millions and millions of documents. You can see more or less uh, what was driving the Israelis, how they did what they did, and so on. <laughs> you don't have that in relation to the Arabs. The Arab uh, archives are all closed for 48. Nobody knows what's there because they're closed. Uh, and, and they don't open them to Israelis, to Americans, to Egyptians. They don't open them, period. 
like all dictatorships. So we, what we get, <laughs> or what we try to understand how, what motivated the Arabs, we have to do it through third parties. Israeli intelligence documentation, foreign intelligence documentation, diplomats stationed in Cairo, Damascus, etc., Americans, British, French, they give us a sort of a, some sort of insight into the Arab side and its motivation. <clears throat> Given all these reservations, one can say one or two things about the Palestinian and the Arab state's motivation or motivations. Without doubt, the Palestinians and the Arab states went to war in the two stages in order to harm the Yishuv, the Jewish community in Palestine. Did they want to throw the Jews into the sea? I'm talking about both the Palestinian Arabs and the Arab states. It's not clear. We don't know. Um, the Jews believed that the Arabs intended to kill them all and throw them into the sea, as the phrase went. But this phrase was almost never used by Arab leaders. It's afterwards, people said the Arabs wanted to throw us into the sea. But they didn't actually say that. The Arab leaders, Husseini, King Farouk of Egypt, Abdullah certainly of Jordan, uh, Shukri al-Kawatli of uh, Syria, none of them used this phrase, throw the Jews into the sea. That's what we're aiming for. And the generals didn't speak. There wasn't a free press in the Arab world, so, and people didn't give interviews. So you don't have that as ev evidence of that, that their intention was to throw the Jews into the sea. It could be had they won the war, both the Palestinians and or the, Pal the Arab states, they would have thrown the Jews into the sea in the sense that maybe there would have been large-scale massacres. It might have happened if they had won the war. But we don't know that, and we certainly don't know if that was what motivated them. All we can say is they wanted to harm the Jews and the Jewish state as it emerged. They probably wanted to cut chunks out of the Jewish state and incorporate them into their own countries, the Syrians in the north, the um, <laughs> Egyptians certainly in the south. The Egyptian army did invade territory as did the Syrians and the Iraqis, territory allocated to the Jews in the United Nations Partition Resolution. But here you come to up to against the problem, because the Jordanians, who had the best of the armies in the Arab world, the best of the invading armies, wasn't the biggest army, it was the most efficient, it was led by British troops, it was financed by Britain, it was trained by Britain, <laughs> um, it was officered by Britain, its leader was a British a, a, a officer, man called John Glubb, the Jordanian army didn't intend to and didn't attack any area of the Jewish state allocated by the United Nations for the Jewish state. It fought the Jews in Jerusalem, it fought the Jews in the corridor between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, but never went into any part of the Jewish state as earmarked by the UN partition resolution. So at least one member of the Arab coalition <coughs> didn't attack the Jewish state and didn't intend to attack the Jewish state, which is important to understand. Why did they end up fighting the Jews? Because it was a battle in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was allocated by the United Nations as a, a what they called a corpus separatum, it was supposed to be internationalized. It wasn't supposed to be Jewish or Arab. So fighting in and around Jerusalem didn't uh, violate, in, in the sense of attacking the Jewish state, didn't violate a, a, the, the UN a sanctioned a deal. <laughs> It did violate the UN decision in the sense that it went to war against the UN decision, the Jordanians as well, but not against the Jewish state. Um, what all, all this amounts to is that we don't know what the Arab states intended in invading Palestine. We know what the Jordanians intended. We have some of their documentation which reached England the public record office in England, or the National Archive in England, eh, and it wasn't to attack the Jewish state. In the sense of Egypt, Syria, and Iraq, they did attack areas allocated by the UN for Jewish statehood. Whether they intended to go all the way to Tel Aviv to conquer the Jewish state, all of its territory, to throw the Jews into the sea, we don't know. A third conclusion which I reached relates to the three refugee problems created by the war of 1948. And there were three, not one. We talk about the Palestinian refugee problem, 
which has remained to this day and therefore is a prominent problem um, and therefore also a major problem as, as it happened in 48. But there were three refugee problems created by the 48 war. One you'll never hear of, and that is the refugees, Jewish refugees in Palestine who became refugees, in other words, were thrown out or displaced or fled from their homes in Palestine, in kibbutzim and towns in Palestine, fled to other parts of Jewish-held Palestine in the course of the 48 war. And there were 70,000 of them. Now, it sounds like a very small number, but it's 10% of the Jewish population in Palestine during the war. There were 700,000 Jews by the end of the war in Palestine. 70,000 of them became refugees in the course of the war. You don't hear of the problem because they didn't remain refugees. They mostly went back to their places because they were conquered or held by the Jews. Um, or if they ended up in Arab hands, like the Jewish quarter uh, of uh, Jerusalem, of the old city of Jerusalem, they ended up being resettled in the Jewish state, so they didn't remain refugees. No Jewish refugee problem from the 48 war uh, in Palestine or Israel. <laughs> but there was that refugee problem. 10%, uh, just to give you an idea, if 10% of Americans were displaced in a war, would be 30 million refugees. So that was the, the size of the, the problem for the Jews in Palestine in the course of 48. <coughs> the second refugee problem created by the war was the refugeedom of the Jewish communities in the Arab lands. <coughs> Sorry. Something like seven to 800,000 Jews who had lived for centuries, essentially, um, in Arab lands, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, etc. 700 to 800,000 of them were essentially displaced or pushed out, mainly by intimidation, not expulsion, but they were intimidated by the societies amid which they lived or by the governments under which they lived in the course of the years 48, 64. In other words, over the course of about 16 years, they were pushed out of the Arab lands became refugees, most of them, especially the poor, and most of them were poor, ended up in Israel and were absorbed by Israel. And the minority who were wealthy or middle class from Baghdad, from Casablanca, ended up or in France or in England, basically, and were absorbed there. So there is no, today, ref Jewish refugee problem from the Arab lands. They were all absorbed, some, for, some better, some worse. Many of the Jews who came from Arab lands to Israel and were absorbed there and settled there, they had the various problems with the way they were absorbed. Israel was very poor. It couldn't absorb them very well. It couldn't give everybody a, uh, an apartment or a house immediately as they arrived. <laughs> Many of them were illiterate. They couldn't actually be absorbed properly in a, an economy in uh, white-collar jobs. Uh, so they ended up doing blue-collar jobs and resented it afterwards. But they were absorbed. That's the point. They weren't, didn't remain refugees, and there is no Jewish refugee problem from the Arab world in this uh, day, to this day. <coughs> the third refugee problem created by the war, and we can talk about it a little afterwards if you like, <coughs> is of the approximately 700,000, and that's a controversial number. The Arabs claim it was 900,000. Uh, Israel claimed in the beginning it was 500,000, but approximately 700,000 Arabs were uprooted from their homes in Palestine um, and became what the United Nations designated as refugees. There is a problem with the designation, incidentally, of the Arab refugees <coughs> um, because a refugee is normally defined in a dictionary. If you look up the Oxford Dictionary, you'll find that definition as somebody displaced by force, by dictatorship, by religious persecution from his country to another country. The Palestinian refugees, two-thirds of them, about 500,000 of the 700,000, were displaced from one part of Palestine to another part, not out of the country, from Jaffa to Gaza, from Jaffa into the West Bank, and so on. 200,000 were displaced out of the country, mostly to Lebanon, Syria, and East Jordan, what is today called the Kingdom of Jordan. <laughs> but apart from that linguistic problem, the United Nations today defines as Palestinian refugees 
um, something between five and six million people, which is the few who remain alive still of those original 700,000 from 1948, plus their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. All are seen and defined as refugees, Palestinian refugees. That too is a problem, especially with, in relation to those who were displaced into the West Bank or the Gaza Strip and are, are the descendants of those because they're not, as I say, truly refugees in the real definition of the word. But, but in any case, the world community accepts those who remain from 48 and their descendants, all of them, as Palestinian refugees, five to six million. And that's a very large number. And that, as I say, remains probably the greatest obstacle, <laughs> at least on the formal level, uh, to peacemaking between Israel and the Palestinians, because it's a problem which has no real solution in the sense that Israel has always refused to accept their return, meaning uh, for obvious reasons, if five million were to come back there would be no Jewish state. There would be a state with a majority Arab population. If you add those five million to the existing uh, one and a half million Arabs who are citizens of Israel and define themselves today as Palestinians. Um, the, Arab, the Palestinian Arabs, on the other hand, regard the return of the refugees as the, the central ethos, in fact, of their national existence. In other words, that's the main aim of the Palestinian resistance or national movements, that the refugees must be allowed to return to their homes and lands, what's, what they call the right of return. So, and, and this is an unbridgeable gap, um, as far as we can see, and so far has been. I'll talk about one last issue and then open the floor to um, That clock is wrong. I'm not sure what the time is. But the one there is definitely not. It's an hour off. OK. So I'll, I'll talk for another five minutes and then open the floor to um, questions. One last subject which arose in the course of researching 48, and that is the balance of forces between the two sides. And that is a subject which is, oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I want to go back. I forgot something which I should have uh, talked about before. One last thing. Uh, when I was talking about war aims, on the Jewish side, I said there were two war aims which were added to the initial war aim of survival. One was expanding the Jewish state beyond the borders allocated by the UN. A second thing which uh, was added to it, and this is the most controversial subject um, among historians, Israeli historians, and that is the, the third war aim which was added on the Jewish side was to reduce the number of Palestinians or Arabs, to put it more accurately, reduce the number of Arabs who would remain in the Jewish state. From April onwards, it wasn't exactly a formal policy, it wasn't an official policy, but there was a desire by Ben-Gurion, many of the generals and the heads of the uh, civil administration, uh, to reduce, to have as few Arabs remain in the Jewish state as possible, which was one of the causes, if you like, of the Palestinian refugee problem. I'm not sure it was the main one, but it was certainly a cause. We can talk about that later. There was a desire to reduce the number of Arabs in the Jewish state, which led in some way or some direct way to expulsions. And certainly to the decision by the Israeli government taken in June 1948, not to allow the refugees to return. So even if they weren't expelled, even if most of them actually fled and weren't physically expelled, they were never allowed back. And that stands, uh, um, you know, that was based on this desire to have as few Arabs remain in the Jewish state as possible. Sorry. To get back to the last issue I wanted to talk about, and that was the balance of forces. The traditional view, at least on the Zionist side, was that the 48 war, the Jewish victory in the 48 war, was a miracle. God given or whatever, somehow the few overcame the much better armed many and won the war. That's the traditional view. When you look at the documentation on the Israeli side, which has been opened since the, 19, the end of the 1970s, 
beginning of the 1980s, you get a much more balanced picture of what the real balance of forces was, even though, as I say, we don't have the Arab documentation. It's not open. But the Israeli intelligence and foreign agencies did sort of understand the numbers and weaponry and so on, which was in, were involved in the war. And what that shows is that the stronger side won. That's what happens, incidentally, in most wars. The stronger side wins, and the stronger side won in this war. And the question then is, what makes a society or a state strong or weak? Numerically, and potentially, the Arab side was much stronger. There were 1.2 million Arabs in Palestine versus 600 to 700,000 six to 700,000 Jews. There were tens of millions of Arabs living in uh, Egypt, Iraq, Syria, etc. around, who eventually <laughs> came to bear on the war. Um, and the Jewish side, of course, as I say, had six to 700,000 people. So numerically, on the face of it, the Arab world should have won. The same applies to the economies, the economy of Jewish Palestine, even though, of course, much stronger than the economy of Arab Palestine, it wasn't potentially as large or as strong as the surrounding world's economy, Arab world economy. But the, the, as it turned out, the Jews were able to mobilize their 700,000 much, much better than the Palestinians were and much, much better than the Arab world in general was. What that meant was the Jews throughout the struggle essentially had more soldiers in each battlefield, almost every battlefield, though not always, but in most of the battlefields, than the Arab side. In, the Arabs invaded. The Palestinians a bit more complicated because the Palestinians didn't have a national military organization. They had 800 different militias, one in each village, one in each town. The Jews, on the other hand, being much better organized, had one national militia and, one or and two small militias, but one basic national militia, which was called the Haganah, which changed its name in June to the IDF, to the Israel Defense Forces. Um, so uh, the, when you talk about the Palestinian Arab militias, I mean, if you add all the numbers of all 800 militias in the various villages, you may end up with a larger number of supposedly soldiers or irregu irregular soldiers than you actually had members of the Haganah. But they didn't come to bear in the battlefield because each village militia defended its own territory. They didn't join together to fight in Jaffa or join together and fight in Haifa. What happened in Haifa and Jaffa was the militia in Haifa fought the Jews in Haifa and the militia in Jaffa fought the Jews without support from outside, essentially. And what happened in these engagement Engagements was that the Jews in each area were much, much stronger than the Palestinians or the Palestinian militias. <laughs> when the Arab states invaded Palestine with their armies on the 15th of May 1948, the invasion forces probably numbered about 20,000 soldiers. Um, the Jews at the uh, Haganah at the time had 30,000 soldiers. Now, it's not that simple. It's not that the Jews were that much stronger than the Arab armies. Firstly, the Arab armies invading <laughs> had heavy weapons, tanks, combat aircraft, artillery, which the Jews almost had none of at all. Uh, but on the other hand, the Jews outnumbered the Arab uh, soldiers. But on the other hand, again, the Arab soldiers who invaded were all combat soldiers, whereas the 30,000 members of the Haganah Facing them, half of them were combat soldiers and half were rear echelon soldiers. So it's very difficult to make the equation. You know, there were uh, plumbers, drivers, quartermaster people, not combat troops. Um, so it's difficult to make the equation, but it's later on it becomes even clearer. By July 1948, the IDF uh, mustered 60,000 troops, and the Arab armies altogether invested in Palestine probably something like 30 to 40,000. Um, by the end of the war, the Israeli army numbered 110,000 people under arms of a population of 700,000, and overwhelmingly stronger than all the Arab states combined in the forces they uh, sent to Palestine. <laughs> it's true that the Arab states had some more troops which they didn't send to Palestine. The Iraqis had to leave troops behind to take care of the Kurds, the Egyptian army had to take care of the, the presidential palace or the king's palace, so they couldn't send everybody to Palestine. 
Um, but nonetheless, in Palestine, in the war zones, the Israelis were much stronger. And from May onwards, they also accumulated large quantities of weaponry, which they'd purchased but couldn't bring in when the British ruled <laughs> from Czechoslovakia and other places. So by the end of the war, even in terms of heavy equipment, uh, planes, uh, tanks, etc., the IDF was at least equal to, if not stronger, than the Arab armies. All of this is problematic to many people because there's a sort of a moral weight to the problem of balance of forces, because everybody supports the underdog. If the Jews are the underdog, as they presented themselves and successfully pre presented themselves to the world in 48, you get sympathy, you get foreign aid, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you're, on the other hand, stronger, then you don't emerge from that propaganda battle about underdogism and, and victimization and so on uh, so well. Um, but what I've given you is more or less the facts. I can give you many more, but um, uh, th these are essential facts about the balance of forces. <coughs> okay, that, I'll leave the, the floor open to questions. Um, please. Yeah, because others can't hear if you don't have a microphone. With the first question. Thank you. Um, while, as you said, we do not have access to the archives of Arab countries, what were the official announcements of Arab governments when they started the war? And what was the language of the fatwa that was also public, right? The fatwa uh, of December and then uh, the, the following fatwas, and they were repeated in various mosques, etc., around the Arab world, as far as we know, um, talked about uh, fighting against the United Nations resolution and the Zionists in Palestine. It didn't talk about throwing the Zionists into the sea uh, or destroying the Zionists, but it did talk about preventing the emergence of a Jewish state. Uh, this is what they, they opposed, and this is what they prevented. The Arab states, when they invaded, um, the Egyptian government issued a, communi a communique um, on the 15th of May, the Egyptians uh, were the strongest of the Arab states, so they didn't send the largest of the armies. The largest Arab army participating in the war was the Iraqi army, which sent five brigades. The Egyptians sent three or four. But the Egyptian state uh, declared, we are going into Palestine to save our Arab brothers. They didn't say we're going into Palestine to destroy the Jewish state or conquer territory of the Jewish state but they, they um, went into Palestine, as they said, to save their Arab brothers, basically from Jewish terrorism. And they were able to point to a few cases of a Jewish slaughter of Palestinians in Deir Yassin and so on, um, uh, you know, as cases in point, and this is what we are going in there to prevent. That's how they presented it. Now, of course, they also wanted to harm the Jews and to harm Israel, uh, without doubt. And they, but they wanted to, they put it in positive language. Saving their brothers is much more positive and acceptable to Western ears than going in to kill the Jews, certainly three years after the Holocaust. Uh, yeah. You say the Jordanians had no territorial aspirations. Say that again? The Jordanians didn't have territorial aspirations. They did. They wanted to take over the West Bank, and not to conquer the Jewish and, state. And Jerusalem, I'm asking you about. That was not... They, they didn't respect the, uh, the notion of uh, autonomous Jerusalem any, any more than we did. Is that a fair statement? Um, yes, it's fair. The, the Jordanians went into the war essentially to take over the West Bank and incorporate it into Jerusalem, into uh, Jordan. And that, the West Bank is that area you see there, they also eventually, within a few days, decided also to go for East Jerusalem, the Arab areas of Jerusalem. They didn't attack as the Jews believed they would, West Jerusalem, they didn't. But they did want to take over the Arab sections of East Jerusalem, which included the old city of Jerusalem, which included the Jewish quarter in the old city of Jerusalem, which they did capture and uh, evacuate, essentially. That is, they threw out the Jews from there. <coughs> 
Um, um, that, that's as to Jerusalem. And the Israelis also, of course, took over West Jerusalem. So both of them violated that clause in the UN partition resolution, which tried to internationalize Jerusalem. You also spoke of Iraqi aspirations for territory. But how say that again? You spoke of the Iraqis having aspirations for territory. Okay, I didn't say that. But the Iraqis did participate in the invasion, and they were sub subordinate to the Jordanians, because for Iraqis to reach Palestine, they, well, we don't have the map, but they have to go through Jordan. They don't have a, a border with Palestine. Uh, so they went through Jordan. They were fellow Hashemite uh, rulers. They were fellow Hashemite kingdoms, and they basically did what um, the Jordanians wanted. But, um, well, we don't have a, um, a, I forgot to bring my um, pointer, but the Iraqi army invaded over here initially, crossed the border over there, and they wanted apparently to conquer part of the Jordan Valley, maybe to reach a place called Afula, which is sort of in the southern Galilee, in the center of southern Galilee. Um, but we don't know where they wanted to go because we don't have their papers. But we know they crossed the border, invaded Jewish territory, certainly not to add it to Iraq, but uh, to conquer it for the Arab side, which whatever that meant, Jordan or Palestinian Arabs or their own. Uh, and the Syrians did the same thing a bit to the north. They crossed the border and attacked an area allocated for the Jews um, by the UN partition resolution. And the Egyptians did the same in the south. The Jordanians didn't. To, con to, continue, on your, uh, to continue on your comments about it wasn't clear what the Arab... It wasn't clear what the Arab... Can you repeat that? I missed the word there. Uh, oh, you okay. To continue on the uh, comments that it wasn't clear what the Arab intention was, uh, the first uh, Arab Secretary General, Azam Pasha, said, this will be a war of extermination and a momentous massacre which will be spoken of like the Mongol massacres and the Crusades. Okay, I've actually quoted that quote in one of my books, but not, never again. It's not a real quote, it's a partial fabrication. What I mean by partial fabrication, he actually was responding to a question in an interview in 1947, not immediately before the war, but about a half a year before the war. And then it was a bit theoretical, would there be a war? And he said, well, it'll be maybe like the Mongol invasion, which meant the Mongol uh, massacres in Baghdad and so on in the 13th century or 14th century, but 13th century. But <laughs> um, um, he didn't say it as it's often quoted and as I did myself to, in my sins, um, uh, as something during the war or just in, uh, uh, as a prelude to the war. Uh, we're talking about um, um, Azam, who was the Secretary General of the Arab League. Um, there is no statement like that by any Arab leader in the course of the war or in the weeks preceding the war. But and that's not a real statement. It's, it's a fabrication which was trotted out. Nobody knows how exactly it came into the history books, and I quoted other people on it. But before that, um, when, I mean, none of the Arab countries other than the Palestinians who were fighting, I mean, they were not fighting. When they invaded, they were fighting to incorporate certain areas into their own countries, not into a state called Palestine for the Palestinians. Isn't that correct? Yes. The Arab states didn't like the Palestinians, to put it mildly. The Arab leaders hated the Palestinian leadership, especially Khaj Amin al-Husseini, who was a perennial liar, followed in that course, in fact, by Arafat later on. But, but, but um, uh, Khaj Amin al-Husseini was not liked. He was hated by most of the Arab states. Abdallah, in fact, talked with the Jews in 46, 47 about killing, assassinating Khaj Amin al-Husseini just before the war. Um, when the Arab states invaded, none of them intended or wanted a Palestinian state. So they didn't invade to help the Palestinians create an, a Palestinian Arab state. They invaded for their own reasons. Um, and one of them was to incorporate territory into their own countries. Um, I maybe should mention one other reason, and that was the Egyptians invaded in part in order to uh, prevent Jordan taking over too much of Palestine in their invasion. In other words, the Egyptian leadership and the Jordanian leadership 
uh, were at loggerheads for years before. There was a traditional rivalry, and King Farouk and his government didn't want Abdallah, the king of Jordan, to get too much of Palestine. So they even sent part of their army, instead of sending their whole army directly north towards Tel Aviv, they split their army into two halves. One went along the coast towards Tel Aviv, and the second arm of their army went up across the border like this, went up through Beersheba to Hebron, to Bethlehem, and even some of it reaching the outskirts of Jerusalem. What that meant was they were trying to take the southern part of the West Bank to prevent Abdallah getting that part of the West Bank. So that was an additional Egyptian reason for going to war, to prevent Abdallah from getting too much. Yeah, there's a lady there at the back. Ah, oh, okay. Thank, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm sure you've read Bernard Lewis. And he makes the point that with the exception of about 100... You have, I don't think it's on. Is it on? It is on. He, he makes the point of, uh, with the exception of about 150 years, between 1800 and 1945, the majority of Jews lived in the Middle East. I don't know if you agree with that, but that's what Bernard Lewis says. Uh, and then he also makes the point that there, or he asserts that there's been a continuous Jewish presence in Israel or Palestine since the, Roman, since the Roman conquest, and with the exception of a few years during the Crusades, Jews have always lived there. So I'm just curious how the narrative of the ingathering of people from within the region fits with your interpretation, and particularly how that works with Israel as a colonial country and apartheid place. In the You're Middle asking East. lots of questions. Um, firstly, I don't think the Jews in the Arab lands were ever a majority among Jews in the world. There were more Jews in the Russian Empire certainly in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. I, I don't know what he wrote exactly. I'm just hearing what you're saying, he said. I'm saying that the Jews, the majority of Jews lived in Eastern Europe in the, the second half of the whatever millennium this we're talking about, second millennium. Um, and the Jews in Arab lands were, were small, in smaller numbers. Um, He's right that Jews lived in Palestine almost continuously. I'm not even sure it's true that there weren't Jews there during the Crusaders. Jews lived continuously in Palestine from the time the Romans ex began to expel Jews in the first and second centuries AD, after the Great Revolt and the Bar Kokhba Revolt. Um, uh, but it's, it's untrue, firstly, there's a myth about that. The Romans didn't expel all the Jews from Palestine. They expelled the elites from Palestine, and other Jews just drifted off over the years for various reasons, and by the 5th, 6th, 7th centuries, there weren't many Jews in Palestine, but there were some. But what, the, the, it's not really a good argument, because it's, uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, there were about 10,000 Jews in Palestine, 10, 15,000. So in other words, the numbers are very, very small. Beginning of the 19th century, there were about 300,000 Arabs in Palestine, as opposed to about 10, 15,000 Jews. Uh, by 1882, when Zionism begins, there's um, something like 25,000 Jews in Palestine and uh, 450,000 Arabs. Those, those are the numbers in 1882. So the number was very, very small after the sixth century in, of Jews in Palestine. Uh, it's used as an argument, a, a political propagandistic argument. Well, the Jews were always there. It's not true that the Arabs were the only native people in the country, but when you look at the numbers, it's sort of fairly meaningless. The Arabs were the native population of Palestine in the 19th century. Very small Jewish. Uh, uh, you asked something else at the end. What did you say at the end? <laughs> it's a complicated subject. What's not complicated is in Jew uh, Zionist haters will say that Israel is an apartheid state and this follows from uh, Zionism and Israel being a colonialist venture. Um, and the subject is, is complicated partly because of the unique nature of Zionism. And I say unique because it really is a unique experience in a world history, a people returning to its land. Colonialism uh, serving imperialism uh, traditionally was the mother country, an empire, sending its sons to third world countries, settling them there to exploit native labor, native resources, resources in the various places, and so on. In other words, serving some empire, the British Empire, the French Empire, and so on. That's the normal nature of colonialism. Europeans from these empires going to these countries, taking them over, and helping the mother country, enriching it, etc. 
uh, the Jewish colonialism was the colonizing by people who believed they were returning to their own land, not to somebody else's land, but to their own land. If you like, they saw the Arabs as the usurpers. The Arabs had never been in Palestine before the seventh century. There was no such thing as an Arab in the Middle East, north of Arabia. But in the seventh century, the Arabs burst out of Arabia and conquered the Middle East, including Palestine. So they were conquerors. The Jews saw them as usurpers of a land which they saw as their own because it had been theirs 700 years before, 800, 1,000 years before, and so on. Um, what is true, though, are the Jews, when the Zionists began moving to Palestine, uh, you know, very slowly in a trickle and eventually in larger numbers, uh, they saw themselves as national, a national liberation movement designed to uh, save the Jews in the world who are under threat and to establish a Jewish state where there had previously been a Jewish state. They weren't serving any empire, though it's true they made alliances with empires, like the British Empire, which issued the Balfour Declaration, which helped Zionism in its first decades. Uh, peoples use whatever allies they can get. Now we have America as an ally. Before that, we had France as an ally. Before that, we had the British for a while. Uh, that's what peoples do, especially small peoples who need uh, big brothers. Um, what is true, though, but they weren't serving the British or the French or the Americans, the, Jew, the Zionists and the Jew, the Israel were serving their own interests when they made these alliances. Um, I'd add one more thing to this though. The Zionist settlement of Palestine was a settlement by Europeans. So in this, it's the same as colonial ventures elsewhere. Europeans settling in a third world country. They were Eastern Europeans, what can you do? That's who came. Um, in addition to that, I would add one more thing which some people don't like to hear, and that is that the nature of Zionism was expansionist. What do I mean by that? I don't mean that they intended to conquer the Middle East from the Nile to the Euphrates, as many Arabs uh, claimed at the time. But what they did want was all of Palestine, which they believed was the land of Israel, which was the Jewish national home. In addition to that, the praxis of settling in Palestine was expansionist in the sense, in a technical sense. In the sense of what did the Zionists do? They bought pieces of land, they put settlements there. The settlements were surrounded by Arab villages. To make the original settlement safe, you planted new settlements around the original settlement to defend the original settlement. But once you planted an outer ring, you needed another outer ring to save, to protect the second ring. So it's constantly expanding from original settlements outwards uh, towards as much of you as they could of Palestine uh, uh, as a whole. So it worked in this sort of expansionist uh, mechanism. Um, but I, I don't accept the apartheid analogy at all. Um, <laughs> apartheid means people don't have the minority, or in the case of South Africa, the majority, don't have civil rights, they don't have political rights, uh, they can't move wherever they like, they, of course, do not elect anybody to parliament. In Israel, it's exactly the opposite. Israeli Arabs all have political rights. <laughs> they are um, equal before the law, even if there is some discrimination against them outside the law courts. Uh, they have political rights, they have Knesset members, they have member, uh, government uh, ministers, they have a Supreme Court justice. Uh, the professions are generally open to them, though Israel does have a lot of industry and uh, technology, which is uh, defense-related, and therefore their Arabs don't often get in, or usually don't get in. Um, uh, but, but generally, the professions are open, and they're treated as equals before the law. As I said, there is also some social discrimination of the sort which you find in most Western democracies against a, a, or vis-a-vis -a, -vis a minorities. It's a majority Jewish state. So Arabs don't feel that comfortable living there under Jewish rule. They'd rather live under Arab rule. At least that's what they say publicly. Privately, I have a feeling a lot of Arabs in Israel are certainly much happier living in Israel with social justice, a, a good health care, etc., political rights, than they would be living in an Arab state. Uh, Dr. Morris. There, there was a lady there I said. She, uh, she went to Minion. She went to Minion. Dr. Okay. Morris. Dr. Morris, back here. Hey, how you doing? 
Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, as a history teacher, I am curious, uh, trying to take this in a different direction, uh, as a professor of many years, like in Georgetown, for instance, I'm curious, what is your experience or observation been of this generation sort of students and how they see the Arab Israeli conflict? And I'm not talking about like on campus the issues, I'm talking about like in the classroom. Have you had any observations of, of being surprised or different points of view than in previous generations? And, and secondly, assuming people have read most of your work, is there any upcoming or uh, current historian on the Arab Israeli conflict that you would recommend to also be looking at these days? Um. Well, I have to admit, um, and this applies to my teaching in Ben Gurion University and in Georgetown, that I sort of teach history. And people don't argue with me about, about pol current politics. It doesn't come into it. We don't talk about current politics. Um, um, occasionally, people will ask questions about various things, but, but I, I haven't felt antagonism to, the, to what I'm telling them or what I'm trying to teach them, usually on the basis of document, documents. It's possible that they think I know a lot of what I know, and, and therefore it's not really, they, they don't have the grounds on which to argue. Um, it could be partly that. It could be that they understand we're talking history, not politics. We're not talking about current political agendas and propaganda and uh, uh, motivations. We're talking about what happened in the past. And about that, one can, I, I feel I can be fairly objective. And they, I think they sense that. But this is just me seeing it. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. So, so I, I now know that my wife was one of the Jewish refugees of that war that you, from your discussion. Um, what, what I'm interested in is this, well, the, the, Palis, uh, the Palestinian refugees being the, the big issue for the, the, uh, uh, the big political issue. It seems to me that the current Palestinian leadership wants the refugees to be the big issue. It's not clear to me that the, that the population wants it. And it certainly would seem, seems to me it would be better for the population if the, if the leadership's first goal was to improve the economic uh, situation of the, popu of, of the Palestinians as opposed to, uh, to talking okay, about Okay, I, I, I get the drift. Um, I agree with you that uh, it would be nice if the Palestinian leadership, and we're talking about the Fatah and we're talking about the Hamas, two different leaderships, but would take uh, more interest in their, in their, their wards um, um, uh, situation than, than in, in gathering the exiles of the Palestinian nation or people. Um, but I think it's, it's very, it's, it's, a major point of, of consciousness, of thinking, of all Palestinians. Because I think they, the, Palis the exiles are not removed from them. They speak the same language. They're often related. That is, it's their families which are living in Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip. So they do think about them sincerely. It's not just a figment of the imagination of the leadership, which is trying to royal some, some subject which really doesn't interest the Palestinian people. It interests the Palestinian people, especially the ones in the refugee camps in Lebanon and Syria where they don't have citizenship and would like to come back, or those in East Jordan where they're discriminated against, they would like to come back even though they have citizenship, and certainly the ones living in, in the slums of Gaza and in the refugee camps in the West Bank. I think they all share this common goal of returning which in a sense is a bit like a mirror image of Zionism, unfortunately. The Jews wanted to come back to the land of Israel, and the Palestinians want to come back to Palestine. Um, unfortunately, there is some sort of symmetry here. Do, yeah. Two more questions. Uh, we could go all night here, but there's going to be a reception afterwards, and Professor Morris will be around for the reception as well. Two more questions. Today we have the issue of Jerusalem. Jerusalem that seems to dominate a lot of the negotiations. But back in 48, how much of the Arab rhetoric was directed towards taking Jerusalem and why the extreme importance of this Al-Aqsa Mosque, which I understand is, is very special, but I don't quite get how they're using it and their basis for that. Okay. So, some critics have said that the Arabs in general as a people or a nation 
take an interest in Jerusalem only when it falls to foreigners, into the hands of foreigners, which is probably in part true. The name Jerusalem, incidentally, doesn't appear, Al-Quds, or whatever you want to call it, doesn't appear at all in the Quran. just doesn't appear. It appears in the Bible hundreds of times. It doesn't appear at all in the Quran. Um, there, is, there is the word Al-Aqsa in the Quran, and there uh, the uh, Arabs who conquered Jerusalem, the first caliphs, uh, um, established on the Temple Mount um, uh, two uh, mosques, the Mosque of Omar, or the Dome of the Rock, as it's called, and Al-Aqsa Mosque. And these are both considered more or less the third holiest site in Islam by most Muslims, as I say, usually in periods when the area is under a threat or under rule by some foreign power, the Crusaders or the Jews in current times. Um, but it's traditionally accepted by Muslims that it's the third holiest site in Islam after Mecca and Medina. Um, and they regard it as a belonging to them. Um, <laughs> that's the way they see Jerusalem, or at least the Temple Mount, the core of East Jerusalem. Yeah. Hello. He needs a uh, microphone. Uh, I did point so, to him. You'll ask, you'll be the last question after him. Okay. Thank you. Just a, a quick question. You said that Ben-Gurion did not want the IDF to go into the West Bank. Didn't want to conquer all of, all of Palestine, including, which two, include the West two Bank. Two things. One, why not? And two, how was it decided where to stop? Okay. Well, the fighting between the Israelis and Jordanians, in other words, on the border, borders of the West Bank, of today's West Bank, ended more or less where the West Bank is today. Not exactly, but more or less where the West Bank is today. The actual fighting between the Jordanians and Israelis. The fighting with the uh, Syrians went on for a bit longer, and the fighting with the Egyptians went on until January 1949. But the Jordanians more or less abandoned the conflict in July 1948. Um, and Israel uh, under Ben-Gurion had a number of calculations in not wanting the West Bank. Um, one of them certainly was the West Bank had a large Arab population, which was reinforced by a large number of the refugees from further inland, from the Jewish areas. And taking the West Bank may, may have meant incorporating a large number of additional Arabs into the Jewish state, which is something Ben-Gurion didn't want. Uh, Alon may have said to him privately, well, we can throw them out, but it wasn't that simple by March 1949. Secondly, uh, the Israelis had been negotiating, the Zionists had been negotiating with King Abdullah from before the war. They had long discussions with him. In fact, the Jewish agency had been subsidizing Abdullah as a potential ally from 1920s. They were giving him money, secretly. It's all secret. But you can see the actual receipts from Abdullah to the Jewish agency in the archives. Um, and they, they believed Abdullah, of all the Arab leaders, might make peace with the Jews. And he said he would make peace with the Jews in 46, 47. They ended up fighting because Abdullah wanted East Jerusalem and was fearful the Jews would try and conquer East Jerusalem. And it doesn't matter the whole reasons for going into battle in, in Jerusalem between the two armies. But after the war, he then opened negotiations with Israel, and they were pretty close to a, a peace deal. It ended up that his grandson, Hussein, ended up making peace with Israel in 1994, but Abdullah wanted it in 1948, 49, 50. So I think Ben-Gurion in 49 thought maybe it's better not to conquer the West Bank, which will, of course, make it impossible to reach peace with Abdullah, because he, that's what he went to war for. Um, another consideration was probably the British. There was an Anglo-Jordanian Treaty of Mutual Defense, which meant the British would come to Jordan's aid. It wasn't clear whether the British would do it if the West Bank was attacked. It certainly was clear if, if Amman was attacked, if East, the East Bank was attacked. But Ben-Gurion didn't want to risk war with Britain over the West Bank, so that may have been a calculation as well. The last question was over here. So I want to thank the previous questioner because believe it or not, he asked exactly the question that I was going to ask. And so that I do not stand between you and everyone here who would like to meet you at the reception. I, I we, we got the idea. have no question. <laughs>
I, I want you all. But, but I do want you all, when you see my wife, Lisa, to, to let her know that I really did decline this question tonight. Okay. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Morris, for your presentation um, and for all those that were helping, that you are welcome uh, to, to join us for, a, for a, a brief reception. So thank you for being here.